Hello, happy Tuesday. Welcome back to another episode of The Practice. This show is an unrehearsed look into my workflow. I'm Stuart. I'm a 3D artist, illustrator, designer, and your pal. And I am excited and grateful and glad to have everyone back again this week. So, lots of new things this week in the world of The Practice. You probably notice a few of them right off the bat. The first of which is a new sort of little segment, let's call it, that I'll be unveiling this week called uh, The Question of the Week. And, you know, the idea is sometimes there's good dialogue going on in the chat, and I appreciate that. Um, but a lot of times there isn't always the most obvious jumping off point for those discussions. And maybe people are, you know, joining who uh, don't necessarily have anything to say on, you know, regarding the, the piece that we're making. But I'd, I'd like to use this just as sort of an ongoing question, even for people who watch the repeats or the replays um, on YouTube after the live stream is concluded and, uh, you know, just give them a prompt to have something to reply to uh, in the comments below. So this week, the inaugural run of the question of the week um, is, have you tried the new and free Blender 2.8? Um, that question relates very directly to the other new thing we're trying out this week, which is sampling some of Blender's new sculpting tools. So um, I understand that the, the new release of Blender is fairly groundbreaking. Um, when I first got into 3D art some decades ago, I, uh, I tried Blender out and really, to be honest, struggled with the interface and figuring out how to use that. And, and um, you know, it just, it was almost like a non-starter. I really couldn't get my head around the interface. I was coming from, um, Creative Suite and Illustrator and Photoshop being the, the programs that I was most familiar with. And I just really couldn't get my head around Blender. But what I understand is over the, you know, the eight or 10 years since I've last tried it, there's been really some significant improvements. And the beautiful thing about Blender is that it's free and open source. So there's like basically no drawbacks. It's just downloading a copy and trying it out. If you don't love it, that's fine. All you've done is maybe waste a little time downloading the thing and, and giving it you know, a play, giving it a trial. Um, and so there you have it. So that's what led me to want to play with Blender today. Now, I haven't explored much of what Blender does, uh, particularly like the general sort of procedural modeling stuff. What I have done is played with the sculpting tools quite a bit. And man, I've really, really enjoyed them. I've been sculpting somewhat frequently in Cinema 4D of late. Because I love what you can get in terms of organic modeling. Um, there's something nice about just grabbing your pen and just altering the model, uh, you know, straight away, let's say. That's not a good way to describe it. Just, just grabbing the model itself and drawing on it and pulling and pushing. And, you know, procedural modeling is great for a lot of things, but um, it has its drawbacks as well. And it's not always the most free form and sort of creative way to do things. So... Sculpting is great, but, you know, the sculpting uh, menus and features in cinema aren't, I think, its strongest skill set. Cinema does a lot of things really, really well. Um, I'm not sure that sculpting is what it does best, let's say. And I have to say that there's a lot of really great stuff going on with Blender's um, sculpting tools. First of all, there's a ton of them. You can see that the tools themselves are more numerous, and I think... Um, I think are, are, you know, can probably get more done, can, you know, fill greater needs. It's, I think it's a little bit more like a ZBrush, which is a program that's specifically designed for this type of clay modeling. Um, and the other thing that I really, really love about, whoa, huh. I don't know what I just did. See, this is this is the drawback to using. Um, there we go. So that's cool. So I'm learning about Blender as we go. Apparently, if you press Z, it gets this this heads up menu that allows you to choose sort of the, the view, the the look of your viewport here. Um, that's not what I want. I want solid. Um, so where was I? Um, the other thing that I really love. I was talking about some of the benefits that uh, the sculpting tools and blender have over cinema the other benefit i think i really love is this dyna topo which basically um 
it allows you to dynamically alter the topography, or the topology rather, of the model as you work with it. So, um, um, so if we zoom in a little bit, you can see that, well, we got, sorry, I'm a little bit clumsy with Blender at this point. Um, you see, as we zoom in and as we use a smaller tool, it will, re, uh, it will redo the topology as we sculpt. Um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing because you want certain, certain areas of your model you may really need to be um, more detailed, more high polygon, and oftentimes other parts of your model, if you're working in cinema, are, are way too high poly because it seems like, unless you guys maybe can correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, there's no dynamic retopology in cinema. So what that means basically is if I wanted to have high resolution portions of a sphere, I would have to make the entire sphere high resolution. Um, so that would mean that you would have uniform high density of polygons all around the model, which is not what I need. So if you could see what I'm doing here, just as some sort of testing, I'm going to make a new file soon before we get into the real illustration for today. But what you can see is if I use a smaller brush, it actually adds and refines the resolution of the mesh as I work, which is really a pretty amazing thing, right? Um, so between the amount of tools and this dynamic topology, it really, it suits me and it seems like a good idea to get to know some of these sculpting tools a little bit better. So that's what I'm doing. So today we're going to make a fun character. It's kind of abstract. We've done a few, uh, a few sample projects sort of like this in previous episodes. Um, but today we're going to start that process in Blender and we're going to generate a mesh before we bring it back over into Cinema and start adding textures and rendering. I do have to say that, you know, I will probably still be leaning into Cinema for all the features that it does well and that I know how to use well. There's something to be said for that. So later on in this episode, I'm going to pop back over into Cinema and use it to sort of put the finishing touches. We're really, we're going to start the process in Blender and I'll show you how to uh, export a model so that it um, export a model so that it can be easily imported into Cinema. First, let me save this. All right, and while I've been blabbing away about Blender, I've got some people queuing up in the chat here. What's up, Ismail, Sunny, Shyam, and Stan? with me for a sec here. Is it too large? Cool. So, I'm not going to go too deep into the different tools themselves, but suffice it to say there are a, diff are a handful of these things, and some of them uh, seem to work really well. Another thing I, I really like over Cinema's sculpting tools is this, this clay strips tool, where it's, it's, it's kind of like real modeling how... Um, how sculptors will kind of add bits of clay to the model. Um, and again, you can dynamically retopologize re the model. So anyway, I'm going to undo all that, get us back to the basics. And then what I'm also going to do is go into these uh, settings here. I'm going to turn symmetry off because what I'm going to be working on will not be symmetrical. I think I kind of like about Blender is this, this sort of viewport widget over here. I like that I can just click on that dot and it'll bring me automatically to the front camera view. So that's kind of cool. So I'm going to start with this blob tool and I'm going to scale it up. I can use the bracket keys to automatically adjust the radius, which is great. I'm going to use this to kind of make some, some broad stroke changes. To kind of make some bumpy areas, just kind of make some interesting, silly sort of shapes.
And now it seems like with any tool I can just hold the shift key and it'll automatically allow me to use the smooth tool, which is cool. It's also great as the, the pressure sensitivity seems to work really well inside of Blender. You can see that's sort of smoothing out as I'm holding shift here. The other thing that seems consistent between all the sculpting tools I've ever used, be it, uh, be it Sculptress, um, Cinema 4D, or Blender, is that holding Command will, will do the opposite. So if the Blob tool builds, if you hold Command and, and press the Blob tool, it'll, it'll subtract. It tends to do the opposite. So as usual, I'm starting with kind of your, your bigger, broader strokes. So doing these large deformations first, and then we'll you know, gradually work in with a smaller brush. I also feel like Blender is a little bit more responsive in this sculpting mode than Cinema is. I mean, this is a pretty high polygon mesh, and it seems to be performing pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really just starting to explore the new Blender, specifically its sculpting tools. I know some people are really kind of, they feel strongly one way or another. I don't have any allegiances to any single program. I mean, I, I really do. I love cinema. Um, it's the program that I know best. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly got its qualities, and from what I understand, the, the new and improved version of Blender really has a ton of advantages over the, the previous iterations, which I tried to use in the past but kind of struggled with, to be honest. But it's free, right? So, I mean, there's, there's like no, there's no barrier to entry. It's, it's definitely worth trying. Gonna zoom in a bit. Whoa. That zoom is pretty aggressive here.
That's interesting. So yeah, so you you found where, where you coming from? Cinema 4D, 8709. It's 8709. Thanks for tuning in, by the way. It's like I mentioned. I don't, I don't know if you caught the beginning of the episode, but I was, I was basically saying that when I first started getting into 3D modeling and 3D art, Blender was the first program I tried, specifically because it was free. I just I couldn't get my head around um, the interface and, and using the thing. It was really kind of challenging. So I think what I should do now is turn that dyno top, top of back on. I think I want is brush detail so that kind of breaks everything but as I come back through I mean not doesn't break everything it just reveals the fong angle but I can come back in and smooth things as we go you can, you can use some of these these settings to adjust uh, the, the level of subdivision you want but you see as I'm starting to get in and do these smaller details it automatically gives me a higher polygon mesh in those areas which is what I want. So even just using the smooth tool, come in here and kind of improve those. And the areas around where I don't need the additional detail can stay in that smaller, or that, that uh, larger subdivision range. And what's cool is if you set up um, brush detail for the detailing, the size of your brush will determine the level of subdivisions you get, which is pretty Let's adjust these dudes a little bit too. I think I'm actually just gonna push them back in a little bit. You see we're getting a little bit of subdivision as we work on that, what we want. Whoa, still getting used to the interface tools here, so bear with me as I play. Yeah, that is one of the drawbacks. I mean, it's, it's amazing to be able to use a bunch of different 3D programs for whatever they're good at. There's even things like Marvelous Designer and um, really specific, you know, like, uh, not body paint, what's it called? That's the one inside of Cinema 4D. But there's all these, there's all these applications that have specific ta uh, you know, tasks that they perform well, like a, like a body paint or like a Marvelous Designer is for cloth or like real flow is for fluid simulations, right? Um, it can get it can get challenging to to learn all their different interfaces. So that is kind of one of the drawbacks to being sort of um, you know program agnostic. One of the beautiful things that I really love about Cinema actually is because it is such a, a generalist program because it can it can get so much stuff done at a, at a high level that it makes it easier because you, you don't have to learn all those different programs and their various menus and interfaces. But um, yeah, there you have it. Um, and I'm sure that uh, ZBrush has some features that uh, that Blender does not. But this is still maybe not as good as, as ZBrush, but this sculpting tool set is definitely better than what Cinemas is. Don't tell them I said that. Oops. All right, so we got some cool bumpy things going on. I 
uh, recessing mouth area. Let's call it that. Hmm. Now Maya is one I don't know anything about. That's one that I've never really even tried. Oh, I see. Okay. For retapo. Well, there's something to be said for being a, a jack of all trades, I think. I'm, I'm that in a way as well, I think. Maybe not so much in the amount of programs that I use, but definitely in the type of stuff that I make. Like I'm, I'm not necessarily a character designer, though I do a lot of character designs. I'm not necessarily an environment designer, though I love working on landscapes and environments. Um, I can animate a little bit, but I'm not great at it. I know a little bit about rigging, but I'm not great at it. Um, I tend to focus on the image of the animation of the final product itself rather than you know, what, it, what it takes to get you there. Now, I'm not sure if that's the best way to work, but that's how I tend to work. <laughs> Suck at lighting. Well, at least you know what to work on. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Really, nowadays it's you know, if you have an internet, uh, if you have access to the internet, then really what you learn and what you're able to learn is is more a uh, it's more about your appetite for learning than it is your of you know 
the ability to access information. The information's all out there. There's no excuses anymore. It's really pretty amazing. Yeah, it does have some seashell kind of qualities, doesn't it? This sort of oyster-like in a way, too. The idea here is to create this sort of amorphous kind of base for the character's head. <laughs> um, what's up, Omega? Thanks for tuning in. Um, I appreciate your enthusiasm, and I understand that you you want to make a mage. Um, I've done characters like wizards in the past, and perhaps I'll do them again, but um, this shows really a lot of it is about pursuing and following sort of what inspires me and keeps me motivated to keep creating. So maybe I'll get to it one day, but... Um, no promises that's going to happen right away. So appreciate your enthusiasm, though. So I'm using a very old Wacom Intuos. Um, I think it's this one's probably, well, probably ten years old, maybe maybe older. Still works pretty well. I mean, I haven't beaten on it. There's been whole years that it stayed in the closet without being used much. Um, I used to do before I got into 3D art. I used to do some digital painting, and that's really what I got it for and, and used it most for initially. Um, Nowadays, I'm not doing as much, and I use it mostly for, for retouching and things like that. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's stayed in pretty good shape over the years because it's seen you know, whole years of inactivity, so I haven't been beating on it for the whole time that I've had it, but it's held up pretty well. It still works well. It was, you know, 80 or, you know, it's probably, I forget how much it was. 
around 100 bucks, maybe between 80 and 120 dollars, but it was 120 dollars well spent. I'm just going through with increasingly small brushes and just kind of building up detail. Which is really kind of a fun, almost relaxing thing to do. So Omega, if, if you're waiting on me, if you're like holding up your project because you want to see how I would make a mage, um, I think, I hate to say this, but I think you're misinterpreting the point of this show. The show is not a tutorial to show you how to make exact things. This show is a uh, basically an open and no holds barred, warts and all look into my workflow. So, you know, sometimes that'll align with exactly the type of thing you want to learn. But most of the time, this is about me um, sharing some ideas, sharing what I'm, I'm sort of inspired by and passionate about, and encouraging others to, you know, work hard at their art, basically, to continue experimenting, to set, us, to set aside time every week if not every day, to create something or to practice what they're good at. Um, bear in mind that I also have, you know, a, a full-time job as an illustrator. So this is all in addition to what my daytime job is, which keeps me pretty busy. And I have to be honest, some weeks, it's really, it's a struggle to get the practice done. I very rarely take a week off, um, only in times when, you know, for example, like I'm taking a, a vacation, like a once every year or two vacation with my wife, or if I'm, you know, moving, I rarely skip this show because of other client deadlines. Like today I'm taking time away from what is a, a fairly full workflow or, or, or a workload to, you know, share with you guys and to sort of keep up my end of the, of the bargain, which is, you know, a weekly practice. So all that being said, I, like I said, I appreciate the enthusiasm and I love that you stop by and have specific requests, but you know, I, I selfishly have to pursue sort of my, my passions and inspirations. And I can't just like, I can't just sort of like take requests every week or, you know, I get sometimes it's kind of frustrating. Sometimes I'll get like, kind of angry or it seems like some of my viewers are upset with me because they're like, you know, this isn't what I asked for or the recording's going too fast or you didn't share all the keystrokes or you're doing that wrong or whatever. Like, you know, if you want to learn specific things on YouTube, there are just so many channels. If you use the right keywords, you can find out basically how to do anything, which is amazing. And I use those tutorials all the time. Because sometimes I have very specific things I want to learn about. Um, this channel is not like that, unfortunately. This channel is. This channel is like I said. It's a it's a look into my workflow. It's live art creation. It's me babbling endlessly about all kinds of BS, and it's me sort of encouraging you to follow your passions. To keep working hard at the things that you want to get good at. So I'll tell you what, if you want to make a mage and send screenshots of the model my way, I'd be happy to give you feedback. I'd be happy to give you some pointers. Um, maybe even I'll create a mage one day. The other thing is like, it's, you know, probably your mage. There's a very specific thing you have in mind that you want to create. And it's, it's possible that my vision of a mage wouldn't fit with what you're trying to make. Plus, if it's part of an overall larger project, and you just want to kind of copy my mage for your game, that's kind of not cool either. You know, if people want to follow along and create something that's similar to what I'm creating on an episode, 
I think that's awesome. But if you want to like use that as a school project or in your video game, I think that's kind of lame. You know, there's a whole huge swath of people whose whole portfolios are just like, you know, you can see like their, their tutorials. You can see it's just like a direct ripoff of something that I design or Grayscale Gorilla has on their website. And, you know, it's kind of dishonest. And tutorials are great for learning things, but that should be so that you, you can take on some technical information and use that to create the thing that you want to create. Not so you can just like have no ideas or creative output yourself and just kind of use this technical skill that you've taken from the tutorial and put that into your portfolio or your game or your project verbatim. I think that's, that's kind of not cool. That's the opposite of creativity. Okay, anyway, I've been blabbing and blabbing. Um, cool, so that's good to hear, Omega. Um, I'll tell you what, let's, let's assume this is a mage. I'm working on a character now. He's going to be really crazy looking. You can imagine this guy with some eyes and some shoulders. So this, this is your mage. This is a mage. Whoops. This is another worldly mage from the depths of some alien dungeon, probably. Yeah, so um, like I said, we'd be glad to give you feedback. I'm, I'm here for you guys, but not in the way that other channels are. <laughs> I do. Uh, my Twitter account is DLGNCE. All my socials are pretty much the same. That's actually a, a shorthand for diligence, which is what I call my illustration studio. Diligence studio. And I have to be honest, although I do have a Twitter account and I'm on there occasionally, I'm not as active as I once was on Twitter. I think the place to stay most up to date with the stuff that I'm working on is, is my Instagram page, which even then I'm, I'm not as active as, as I could be. Um, I've been kind of leaning away from social media a little bit of late. I find a lot of times I'm just kind of on there looking around and I could be productive. I've also had a ton of client work lately. So, um, you know, when I'm not busy with client work, I'm, I'm trying to, make personal art and share it on social media. Um, but lately, I haven't had a ton of time for, for personal work. 
been working a lot of weekends and just trying to keep up with client workload. So, and that's that's a great thing. That's those are good problems to have. So I'm definitely not complaining, but I'm not as active on social as I occasion as you know I sometimes am. It's been a little bit slow of late for me on social. What do I think of the current state of cinema for D? For D, cinema for D. Where are they pushing? Uh, they are pushing everyone to Redshift. That'll be interesting. Um, I know there's a new release coming out. Uh, I'm not sure if that's going to have the Redshift included. Um, I'm sort of hoping that um, they include Redshift and bake some of that technology into their existing native renderer like the standard or the physical renderer, which are things that I use all the time. Um, I think, I think it's a good thing. I think, I think cinema, you know, I think they know what they're doing. I mean, they, I think body paint was a separate program that they incorporated. Um, and I, th I think that's kind of cool. I think that's worked out. Um, and I think it'll probably be good for Redshift to have additional resources put into their render. I think it could be a win-win. Um, what's up, Gozali? Thanks for tuning in. Yes, it is Blender. Um, and yeah, I agree with you, 8709. Social media can be very unproductive. All right, let's get a front view of this. Zoom out a little bit. Whoa. This is fun. I am feeling this. I think we need some, whoops. We need some places with maybe some slightly larger details again. So let's get into that. Why, thank you. <laughs> yes, I do have Twitter, uh, Omega. I have, I have Twitter, but I don't use it that much anymore, as I was explaining. Um, I'm much more active on Instagram, but have been less active uh, on social media sort of overall in the last several months. Hey Spooky, um, so I did spend the first, uh, the first, whoops, I spent the first uh, portion of the episode really discussing that. I think it's amazing uh, for a free program how sort of robust and high quality these sculpting tools are. I think uh, Cinema has some nice sculpting tools and I, I've used them increasingly of late, um, but I think, I think it, Blender's got the leg up. They've got this thing called Dynotopo, which allows the topology to be adjusted dynamically as you're sculpting, and you can add areas of detail where you need them instead of like uh, instead of increasing just you know with brute force the overall uh, the overall subdivisions in your model. 
which is, is really awesome. And they do, they have a, a broader range of sculpting tools themselves. I, I've really been enjoying it. Uh, that's cool, yeah. I mean, I imagine that um, that funding has sort of helped them with this new release because it's been, it's been awesome. Okay, cool. Thanks, Omega. I'll, I'll check that out when I'm done here. Cool, yeah, check it out, Spooky. And also download a copy, I mean, it's free. I guess for, for everyone just tuning in now, I'm, I've started sort of a new segment this week. Which I'm gonna try to have a new question every week. Um, this week's question of the week, have you tried the new and free Blender 2.8? I definitely already know that answer for some of you in the chat as you've been talking about your experiences with it, but that'll be great for everyone catching the live stream, stream after it's over in, uh, you know, one of the uh, you know watching the recording after the fact on YouTube um, um, I can get smoother normal displays uh, I think like this um, which is nice but for now it's cool to see uh, sort of where the mesh is uh, getting subdivided Oops.
All right, I think we're getting pretty close to the point where we want to import this bad boy into cinema, start lighting, texturing. Pretty wild, pretty abstract stuff going on here. Some of that might be superfluous detail. I'm not sure how much of that's going to be visible from inside cinema. Right, so let's try this. Let's let's get it over into cinema. To low res mesh, what would be your workflow with Blender and Cinema for the purpose of sculpting and baking displacement? Well, so for this exercise, I've been going really high poly on the mesh. Um, so I'm not sure if I have a great answer for you. What you could do is start with a lower poly mesh and you know just do it care like sculpt carefully so as to not to increase the polygon count so much. And then you could bring it into cinema and use things like the polygon reducer um, to bring it down. I'll show you what I mean. Um, so I'm going to save this file quickly and I'm going to export it. Whoops, file, export. I find that FBXs tend to work really well. Um, export. Now let's boot up cinema. And let's merge. Ooh, can you merge a Blender file directly? No, you can't. But grab this FBX, bring it in, and then, whoops, delete the camera and delete the light. And you'll see there it is. There is our crazy high polygon sculpted mesh. Let me just adjust that Fong tag so we get a little bit more of a smooth fall off. And then look at that. Now we've got this crazy character mesh that would have been quite difficult to achieve with the blending tool, uh, the sculpting tools inside Cinema. We're able to do it fairly easily with, uh, with Blender. So that was fun. Now what I'm going to do is making make a little character out of this. So you've seen this trick before. I'm going to take two spheres, just kind of plug them in as eyeballs. That's too big. What I could do is Let's throw this inside of a null and then a symmetry object. And we'll see if symmetrical eyes wind up working well actually for this character. We might find that we want to place the eyes ourselves manually. Um, I might just adjust the angle of the head itself just a touch. And yeah, that's that's not gonna work. So I'm gonna do the undo those movements. See if we can just sort of manually place these eyes. Not sure if symmetry is going to be the way to go. Now, a smart thing would have been perhaps to add these eyes in Blender and sort of sculpt around them. Find a place where the eyes look good. 
think this is actually pretty good. Not worrying about symmetry so much here like I do for most of my characters. And now I can also do, I'm gonna set up a camera angle for myself actually first. So, zero this guy out. Be good. What I'm gonna do, it's just because this eye is set back a little too far. I like the way that guy's placed. Just going to do a soft selection, get down to the appropriate size. Well, this mesh is pretty small. Right, let's do that first before we do anything else. Let's just scale everything up. I'm going to scale the camera and everything as well along with it. Um, I'm going to zero these guys out. Move all that back just a little bit. All right. Now let's add some really simple shoulders here. Some cube. Which we will round off with a fillet. Because this is the, the head of this character is so insane and richly detailed, I think it makes sense to keep shoulders really kind of simple so they don't compete. All right, now I've got a basic idea of what I want to do with lighting. What I want to do is have the lighting um, highlight the crazy topology here. So let's set up some quick materials. We'll start playing. Whoops, not a camera. Spotlight. Nice big spotlight and a fairly direct overhead angle. What that's going to do is cast shadows over all these crazy bumps and details that I think will highlight them in a nice way. Let's play with a little subsurface scattering here. Which works great here even without ambient occlusion turned on. It's giving us some nice soft lighting as it, as it sort of penetrates the surface of the model.
pretty cool already. Try a little square format action. Fairly crazy looking. I'm going to add a little ambient occlusion, which I think is going to help highlight some of these bumps. Push that up a little bit. The shadows are a little stronger. I also think that our angle is a little too upright. I think we want to angle it off a little bit more, just so we can get a little more of the chin area. and a little better overall illumination. Make more of that detail in the lower portion of the model visible better already now. Trying out some new textures for the eyes. Get a little bit of a reflection there. And the ambient occlusion will definitely help get us some additional shadowing, which you can really see in some of these recessed details, which is pretty cool. Yeah, now a lot more of our details have become visible. I think perhaps I could go up a little higher on the luminance here. Maybe add a bit of green to it. Right now I'm throwing on some GI just to see what that's going to get us. It'll take a moment longer to render. I think it's going to give us a better quality of light sort of passing through this model. Should illuminate more of the area as well as we get a bit of get, get a bit more bounce.
You can see on the interior of that mouth, we're getting more of a light flow. It's definitely more realistic overall. I'm wondering if we need just a little bit of a low light to help with our, our look. Take this light, maybe make it kind of bluish, and then drop the intensity way down. Turn the shadows to area. Let's see what we get. It's definitely going to help fill in some of these lower areas. So we get here. Going into the sculpting tools here in Cinema, hoping it reacts well. I'm just, I'm not loving the way that this eye is intersecting with the model behind it. So I'm gonna try and model a little bit more of an eye socket. Let's see how. You can see it's, I mean, with the same mesh, it's definitely more laggy in Cinema than it was in Blender. Blender was, was really, surprisingly snappy. Actually, let's quit this. Maybe that'll make a difference. Do the same thing over here while I'm at it. Actually, let's push this back a little bit. I exaggerate this eyelid area. without and with that blue light. Yeah, I like that. I think we can even go a little bit bluer, a little bit brighter. One last thing I want to try. Might be a little bit wacky, but let's take a couple of these deeper holes put the luminant object inside of there.
This is, I think is going to give us some nice contrast with the dark background and with this monochromatic creature. I think also with the subsurface scattering and ambient uh, and global illumination we have going on, it'll uh, create some really interesting lighting effects. Let's hope anyway. You can definitely see the light penetrating areas of the model around those little glowing spheres, which is pretty cool. Not as much here where the, the lighting is pretty bright. Ooh, I really like these. I think that the darker eye was a good call. I think creating those indentations for the eye to sit in was a good call. I really like the little highlight where the little accent highlight here we're getting beneath from the blue light. Looks cool. I do enjoy the way these sort of sit inside of the model. Kind of a neat effect. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, actually. All right, crank the gamma up a little bit. Let's try one more test rendering. Get a spam call over here. I'm also thinking, does this guy need kind of a little tongue in this big gaping mouth of his? Perhaps he does. I think that increased gamma. Pretty good. Maybe too far, actually. Down to 1.3. Let's see how that tongue looks.
Yeah, I like the top. But I'm thinking maybe I'm not crazy about this color range either. Yeah, definitely need the top. Let's try a different color range real quick. Hardly ever use red. Let's, let's give red a try. The yellow and red. This might be our winner here. And now I'm not sure if I'm going to have much time for it today, but what would be really cool is to take this sort of character experiment, bring it into Photoshop, and then do a paint over. A couple episodes back, um, I did an episode where I, I did some sculpting and created a character with a similar sort of look in cinema, and I rendered it out, and I spent about an hour um, just painting over it in Photoshop, adding tons of additional details and texture and you know noise and darkening certain areas, lightening certain areas, and just adding a bunch of additional visual interest as sort of a 2D paint over. came out really, really cool. I think there's a lot of potential to do that with a character like this. I think I like this color range too, better than the uh, green and yellow. It's a little creepier with those red glowing bits, huh? So let's save out a copy, not as a TIFF. Cool. Now let's give them a quick Quick bit of love in Photoshop. Let's try a quick bit of painting over. I like to add some noise. Whoops, not filter gallery. Filter, add noise. Let's add a good amount. Set that to multiply. Oh, much darker. I'm gonna delete it. Luckily, I've got my handy dandy tablet already. I'm going to pick one of these brushes that I like. Is it this one? Seems too big. Yeah, there we go. And now what we can do is draw in noisy areas. This is not the pencil I want. There we go. So if we want to add darkness to certain areas, I think this is too dark. Let's turn that down. We come in here and add kind of some noisy darkness to some of these areas. <laughs> noisy darkness is kind of a funny phrase. See, I can do things like this where I'm just darkening whole areas. It's kind of nice. And I can go in and sort of like sculpting, just add in additional details.
you come through and really just add detail to or exaggerate the look of certain areas. What I'll also do is just grab some of this yellow color, set a layer to like overlay, something like that. Let me come through and add some additional uh, highlight details. could be really fun. I could just get super carried away with this. Picture myself spending days just buried in here, adding fun little details. This is a cool way to really take your rendering and add some kind of painterly qualities to it. Um, sometimes 3D models feel a little bit stiff. You think, man, I wish this was a little more eh, artistic or had a little bit more variation or a bit more of a hand-drawn feel to it. Sometimes adding all the detail in that 3D model itself is really cumbersome and time consuming and, and perhaps not necessary for the project you're working on. You can just come through and add it in Photoshop. Just paint it right in. could probably also do things where work with larger brushes and you could just start introducing you know whole different colors if I wanted you know say this part of the character be a slightly different color
All right. Now that is a very wild and strange, but very organic and richly detailed character design. I had a lot of fun playing with the new blender in this episode. I think the sculpting tools are something I'm definitely going to revisit in future episodes. I could really see it augmenting my workflow nicely. So uh, not only that, it, it was fun to try three different programs um, in this single episode, Blender, Cinema, and Photoshop, each adding their own sort of unique strengths to um, what could be a very useful workflow. So really appreciate you guys all tuning in. Um, hopefully you found something useful. Um, if you like what you saw, please give the video a, a like and a thumbs up and hit subscribe and you'll be uh, you know, first in line to see new episodes that uh, are live on this channel every Tuesday. Uh, if you want to keep up with me and the work that I'm doing, please hit me up at DLGNCE on Instagram and check out my website at diligence.studio. And in the meantime, keep up with your practice, keep creating cool stuff, reach out with any questions, and I'll be seeing you guys for another episode this time next week. Thanks. See ya.